Well, here we are, Adam. Here we are. At our last live office hour for introduction to Italian opera MOOC. Can you believe we made it this far? I, I can't believe it's the last one already. It feels like just yesterday we started the course. Yeah, and yet we've been working on this for what, how long? Like well over a year? <laughs> I mean, when it's, did you come to Dartmouth? Uh, I joined Dartmouth uh, September of last year. And so here, yeah. we started about October last year. So we're just past a year a year in the making and That's for this. right. And I remember them introducing me to you and saying, we hope it's okay that you're going to have this new kid on the block working with you. <laughs> and then it's somebody who doesn't know anything about opera. So as you look back on the year, what do you think? <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, I it's been one of the most incredible courses I've ever worked on. I mean, I, I've learned so much about Italian opera and the way students engage around learning with each other. It's, it's just been, it's been an amazing, it's an, an amazing experience. Well, and, and thank you for teaching me a lot about this kind of medium in terms of what works in uh, this online MOOC environment, how we go about structuring assignments. Um, as you know, this is very different in many respects from the on in class version of the opera class I teach. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on in this live office hour. But thank you for being on this journey with me, teaching me a lot, and hopefully all of us together have learned uh, a lot more, not only about Italian opera, yeah. but also how to learn in this MOOC environment. And thank you for teaching me as first student. You, you bet, Adam. <laughs> so, um, yeah, on so, to some of the details about our live office hour. Yep, so just a couple of housekeeping things. So how to ask questions during our live office hour. Um, you can ask questions in two ways. You can use the Q&A tool that's built into Google Hangouts. You'll find that on the right side in the app. Um, you can also uh, use the discussion forum that we have set up for this live office hour inside of the, the edX course. Uh, and memory will be monitoring both of those. OK. And as always, we have a few little housekeeping details to pass out to everyone here in our community. A couple of final housekeeping things, yeah. So um, the due dates in the course are all set to November 24th at UTC 0. Uh, so that is the last time you'll be able to turn in any assignment for it to count towards your grade. Um, certificates will automatically be generated at that point based on whether you have a 60% or higher in the course. If you run into issues, uh, we're not entirely sure. We're, we're kind of learning the certificate workflow as we go. And they've recently changed that for the team side of things, uh, for the course team side of things with edX. If you run into any issues and your, your certificate hasn't posted within a day or so, uh, contact edX support directly if you run into issues with that. Some other final, final items as we're rounding out at the end of the course. We have a survey posted in the course on the bottom of the left-hand navigation. We're going to keep this open for a week or so. Uh, we really are looking forward to getting your feedback about the things that worked and didn't work with this course experience. Um, as you might remember, this is, our, this is our first time doing a MOOC, and it's our first time doing this MOOC specifically. Uh, so that feedback is very much welcomed. We'll also be launching a, a really fun and exciting finale, uh, which is which is exciting. We, we've been waiting for this to launch for a while. Uh, so the finale will launch tomorrow, and you'll find that as another subsection on the left-hand navigation. The course will be available after November 24th and 25th as an archived course. We'll get to this a little bit more when we get into the questions, uh, because there were some specific questions about that. So I'll, I'll handle that at that point. And now let's dig into some questions from everybody else. Well, before we do that, I want to say a little bit more about the finale, because we're Please. a little bit unclear uh, about what actually you're going to be able to see on the course. Because in some ways, the this finale lecture is similar to what I do in class, which is much easier to do when we're in a room and behind the Dartmouth firewall, where I can show examples that are clearly copyrighted. And so we're not quite sure uh, if uh, the powers that be out there in, these, in cyberspace will let our videos go through. So we have a couple of options. And we'll probably put some text on there so you can know what we were hoping to put on in, in case the thing that we hope to put on is not there. But there are a lot of Easter eggs in that finale, and we hope that we can deliver them to you uh, tomorrow. So uh, by all means, try and look at this finale as soon as you can, because uh, if the <laughs> takedown notices come, uh, you want to be able to have seen it in, uh, before that happens. Most definitely. All right. Now, on to our questions. 
So the first question uh, was one that we had last week, and I mentioned at the time that I thought I might come I'll back to it. it. Yep. So uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. It was uh, Jordi Prats Rodriguez asked about if operas are faster nowadays, and specifically asked about La Cenorentola and the fact that in the score that uh, she or he saw, uh, it indicated how long the overture should take. Uh, and so I, I said I'd look at some things. And so we've got some slides for you to look at here. The, the, one of the first slides I, I found online through um, just IMSLP, a very okay. useful place to go if you're looking for uh, manuscripts and, and um, scores of just about anything that's in the public domain. And so here's an undated manuscript of La Cenorentola. And the important thing here to notice is uh, there is no uh, indication in the corner, uh, any corner, that says how long mm -hmm. this will take. There's also, very interestingly, no indication of how fast to play this, like mm -hmm. no tempo marking, mm -hmm. no metronome marking. We get the that uh, tempo marking in the next slide, which is the first page from the critical edition of La Cenorentola that I just uh, scanned from uh, our music library here at Dartmouth. And so there it says maestoso. So it gives us an idea of how fast this is supposed to be played. But here again, we don't have either a metronome marking that tells us exactly how fast maestoso is, nor does it say on that very first page how long the entire overture should take. So I, I'm imagining that this individual saw a score that some other editor uh, penciled in or wrote in that it would take approximately 10 minutes, maybe to help people know how long the entire opera was mm -hmm. supposed to take. But based on my limited research on this, uh, that number that it says that overture should take 10 minutes uh, doesn't come from Rossini's hand. So there, there's... Glad we question. had that follow up. All right. So now we have another question. This one deals with the question about close listening. So how do you recommend us opera nuts to approach a new opera in the future, especially if we are not familiar with the composer's idiom? Man, and he mentions two composers. We'll get to them in a second here. So, um, so there were a couple of things. First of all, I love the fact that uh, Franklin O is talking about opera nuts. Yeah. So um, I, I, you know, I don't know where We've people succeeded. started out when <laughs> when they came into this class. I mean, there were obviously some yeah. people who knew a lot about opera, but a lot of people who didn't know much about opera. And so uh, Franklin's, oh, I don't know if you were a nut before you came to us or you've become a nut. Um, reminds me of Almond Joy and Mounds all of a sudden. <laughs> sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Anyway, um, first of all, there are few things that uh, we can know about everything. And so when it comes to all of the operas out there, um, we you can't know it all. So one of the things, the one of the big tools, if you know, a set of tools that we wanted to give you all in this course uh, were, uh, were understandings of all these different opera moments like Handel or Mozart or Rossini, or Verdi, Puccini, that we talked about these operas and gave you tools to understand those operas that then could be turned loose on operas from those periods. So mm -hmm. if you learned something about Bel Canto opera and you learned, uh, you watched a Rossini opera, that should serve you in good stead if you're looking at Bellini or Donizetti. Uh, the same way, if you looked at Puccini, uh, then that will help you when it comes to um, doing the work with um, like Giordano, Chilea, all these other things. So um, what I'd say then in terms of the particular operas that uh, this question has raised to us is whether or not, whether or not um, Bert Whistle and Otis, these two composers are... We went off there. Okay. Okay. Do we know where it froze? At the, when you were answering this question. Okay, so are you rebooting? Um, yeah, I guess we will have to do that. Okay. And we can't get uh, anything in until we reboot? Right. Okay. I, I noticed the screen froze, and so I was like, uh-oh, what is that? Yeah. Um, remember, you might be able to type in. Oh, into the Q&A. Yeah.
um, there was this uh, in the middle of the performance all of this is happening and then uh uh they fix whatever they needed to fix I think we're live. okay we'll know in a few minutes. okay so uh here we are uh kind of waiting you know people are buzzing about uh in the auditorium and then finally we go back and i think they must have done some doctoring of both the super titles which at san francisco were broadcast above the screen. So I'm telling a story about um, the fact that we went off line and now that we're back on and talking <laughs> about this happening in a live opera Doing with Don Carlo uh, in San Francisco Opera, big metallic clank. And um, so they cleared the scene, brought down the curtain. I think they must have changed some of the super titles in the middle. And so it's Carol Van Ness, as I seem to recall, was a, the woman singing here. And the first words she sings were, were where was I? And then she continues on her <laughs> her aria, and it was like, like okay, that was that was a nice way of, <laughs> nice of way you know, coming coming back to the middle of uh, Don Carlo, which as I've told you before is one of my favorite Verdi operas. Mm. So here I was in the middle of answering a question right. about uh, well, what do you do if you're going to go to an opera and you've never been to that opera before? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you do this? And then there were was a specific question about two composers. And so, as I was saying, it's, um, hopefully we've given you enough tools to know if you go to a Handel opera that you've never seen before, or, Viva, Viva, oops, or a Vivaldi opera, uh, that you could be ready to uh, receive that, or a Mozart opera, or a Rossini or Bel Canto opera, that we've given you tools to be able to apply across a wide range of Italian opera. Mm -hmm. And we've stuck with Italian opera uh, in many respects because it's some of the most easily accessible opera um, as well as uh, it ends at a certain time. I think I was telling you how uh, Jeopardy just the other day had a category called the Metropolitan Opera, and four of the five My answers. told me about this too. Yeah, four like, of the five questions, if you will, uh, were about Italian opera. Yeah. So I thought that was very That's interesting. Fun. So uh, Franklin O though asks about two English operas uh, by two composers who are still alive: Bert Whistle and Otis. Uh, uh, Bert Whistle is in his 80s, Otis is in his 40s. Uh, how can you prepare to listen to these uh, operas? And it's somewhat similar to what I would say is uh, if you can listen to the sound, uh, the, both the sound world of those operas, as well as if you can get your hands on the operas themselves, you'll be much more prepared than to enter into the musical uh, universe that they will describe for you. In the case of Otis, I, I'm quite excited that uh, Franklin O asks about that. The Tempest, which is uh, Otis's second opera, is an opera I've seen both in Covent Garden mm. uh, in 2007 and then at the Met a couple of years ago. And I, I, I will tell you, I will go out of my way to see that opera. Those people who talk about how the, the libretto is um, makes a, a problematic opera out of that work, I disagree with them mm. and uh, feel like you need to go see and hear that opera because it's remarkable, remarkable singing. But one of the things I did is I, I happen to like Otis's music, so I, I know that sound world, and so then when I step into it, I'm much more able to appreciate what's happening dramatically. Do you have specific tips for like going into that composer's world, learning more about kind of learning more about them, their creative process? and some of those things before you go to the experience? Well, this is kind of like weeks two and week yeah. three of our class, right? So week two, you learn about the history. Um, so you read up on that person, you know, what, what is Bert Whistle interested in? Or in the case of uh, Chiarino, you know, we had an Italian opera I mentioned of his, you know, what, what kinds of things did they look for, look at as they were uh, constructing their operatics worlds? And then, um, 
week three, the whole idea of conventions, you know, so in the case of Otis, he really likes uh, early 18th century French music. Mm. So if you listen to Louis or Francois Couperin, you are more likely to appreciate uh, Otis's work than if you don't know that mm. music or Rameau. So uh, these are things, you know, kind of things that you can find out after reading about these uh, composers and their works, of uh, finding uh, YouTube or going to the library or actually buying their their music and listening to it. And then I think that adds to the appreciation of what you'll find in the opera house. Great tips. All right. We have a question of a uh, very long one, if we were to get to it all. Uh, I think this is Jennifer K. Thompson about Turandot. Uh, but we're going to distill the question into a little kind of kernel. What in the world is going on in this opera? That's, I think, the kernel. <laughs> you know, is this opera as out there as it seemed to Jennifer to be? Uh, and if you go back to the longer question, and, and I think we can find that in a text somewhere on the class, you'll see that she's asking uh, about, first of all, the music. Is the music out there? And then is this drama out there? Those two different things. So uh, Jennifer, as you correctly noted, this is quite modern music for Italian opera. Again, this was a uh, finished, um, or uh, Puccini died before he could finish it all. He sketched out everything, uh, fully uh, composed everything up to Liu's death. Um, and uh, 1924, so this is a time when in Germany, especially Austria, uh, also in the United States, there's a lot of experiments being done in the sound world. So mm -hmm. you've got Schoenberg, you've got uh, Richard Strauss. Uh, in Italy, you've got Russolo making no you know, with his noise making machines. So so already we're trying to reconceptualize what sound mm -hmm. sounds like. And so uh, Puccini, as these other composers are. are concerned is still relatively con uh, conservative. But for Puccini, if you compare Torando to uh, Tosca or La Boheme, yes, there's dissonance, there's atonality, um, a lot of different things, whole tone scales and and just weird, weird, wonderful mm -hmm. harmonies. Even in like Nessun Dorma, where uh, it starts in G major and then you get this really kind of clashing chord when uh, Kala sings Nessun, you know, and mm -hmm. so, um, it's all shot through the opera. So musically, it's it's fairly progressive for Puccini, but compared to some of uh, the composers riding around him, consider Stravinsky in The Ride of Spring. We talked about that last week, which was 1913. So Puccini is uh, still not nearly as far out there as some of the composers around him. As far as the drama is concerned, I mean, this is a fantastic story, and I mean fantastic in the sense of fantasy. And mm -hmm. so you have to d suspend your belief that this could actually happen you know would there ever be a princess who would uh forswear marrying anybody unless they could answer these three riddles and if you answer them incorrectly off with your head and there's just a parade of heads that happens in act one and and you know that she's so attractive that uh Kalaf just swoons and he's going to uh, get in on the scene i mean and and again you have to suspend disbelief because torandot can be this 250 pound soprano and Kalaf falls in love with her and is like yeah really that that's <laughs> happened uh, you know and so uh, you just enter into the the craziness of the story and you know as an analogy uh two days ago i was at northern stage i guess this is a shout out for our local theater company uh they're doing mary poppins mm -hmm. now do any of us really believe that a woman can open an umbrella and fly across the sky <laughs> um that that's just absolutely ridiculous dan the cameraman is like I do. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe he does. But anyway, I'm sorry if, if there are any children watching. I didn't mean to spoil it for you. Uh, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Okay. Now, uh, but you know, you just suspend belief when you have these things. And so take the story of Turandot with a shaker of salt yeah. and just glorify in the marvelous music that Puccini wrote for it. Okay, we've got a live question here. Uh, about Verismo, uh, uh, Ceci MX, uh, thank you again for joining us and, and sending in a question. So. Yeah, so what is Verismo? Is it a movement or a style? Does it have its own conventions? Which composers took part in it? So uh, Ceci MX read that Puccini was also involved in Verismo. Um, 
so Verismo is more of a literary movement in Italy, uh, starting in, in the 1870s, uh, moving into the 1880s and 90s, and it was the idea of Verismo, veristic, uh, true, uh, was to do something that was true to life. And so if you can think of, you know, the big opera from 1870, I already mentioned it, Aida, mm -hmm. um, that's obviously not what's happening in Italy or anywhere in the world at that time. So there was a, a kind of a story constructed to have this operatic topic. What the, Veris, uh, the Verismo artists wanted to do was they wanted to represent real life in what was happening. Mm -hmm. They wanted that in literature, they wanted it in theater, and so composers came along and started doing that kind of thing as well. So uh, the two big Verismo operas that people talk about are Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci, Cav and Pag. And the idea mm -hmm. that in the latter you've got this touring uh, um, theatrical troupe, uh, and you have the intrigue of the lovers mm -hmm. uh, going on, and that he stabs uh, them. You know, so that's you know considered. You know, maybe that could actually happen. In the case of Cavalleria Rusticana, it's based on a story mm -hmm. from you know torn out of the papers of uh, you know what was going on in Sicily. So, um, and you know. Uh, a lot of what Verismo has is a lot of blood and guts, you know, kind of the Jerry uh, uh, Bruckheimer, I always forget his name, <laughs> kind of that kind of stuff going on there and on the operatic stage. Puccini is associated that with that in his early part of his career okay. um, because that's the atmosphere he's growing up in, um, but he starts turning in, in different ways, and again, we can um, see that by his choice of topics. So La Boheme, which is based on a mid-19th century story, Tosca, set in 1800. So already he's mm -hmm. removed himself from the real-life happenings mm -hmm. of what's going on, but he brings a lot of the, if you will, blood and thunder um, concepts to the, the writing of the music that he does. And so that, I guess, would be part of the veristic uh, atmosphere that he's involved in. So Adam, here's a question I think that you need to answer. Somebody asked, why do we need peer reviews? Uh, specifically, you know, having other people look at uh, their work versus uh, self-grading. Uh, why the need for the opera tuning peer review activities? Yeah, and, and first off, um, Cliff Grunt, thank you, thank you for the question. I think this is a, a, really, a, a really great question to ask about kind of our, our thought process behind the course overall. Um, so one of the things that we've done as we've been going through this, this experience is figuring out what are the different things that we're learning about the way the activities are going while the course is actually running, and how can we learn from some, some of those experiences. So we knew uh, when we set out to design this course that we needed some way of allowing students to apply their listening skills that they were gaining at various points. Um, so we chose to do the opportuning assignments as a way of doing that. Initially, we thought peer review because we saw the tool was largely based around that and that that would be a meaningful way of both allowing you to use a rubric but also giving feedback to one another. We also knew then one way or another we had to assign a grade to it. So by having multiple people grading it probably helps them to give you some of that feedback um, related to it and, and making the grade have more behind it. Um, what happened in the second half of the course, uh, I was taking another MOOC at the same time. I took a course from Smithsonian Exxon uh, teaching historical inquiry with objects. And they had a few homework assignments that used uh, a similar idea where you were given a prompt, there were specific guidelines and, and kind of a structure for doing that. But the idea was uh, you actually use self-assessment instead of peer assessment. We talked about it as a team and we we thought, you know, let, let's give this a shot. Let's Let's see how this works for our students. And it seems we got a lot of good feedback that the self-assessments uh, self um, that we did in the opera individual adventures at the end of the course worked pretty well. Um, so the long and short of it, we, we thought that we needed some sort of application activity, but it didn't necessarily have to be peer review. And now I think we might play a little bit more self-assessment in the future just because of those kind of added logistical barriers of having peers reviewing and, and some of those things. And as you said at the very beginning of this office hour, this was the first time we've done this. Yeah. And so we've been learning as we've been going through this. And uh, you know, use that survey at the end of the class Please. to tell us what worked best for you, what you would like to see if we reconstruct this course in uh, the next time we offer it. Uh, so um, that's, I, I'd say, how all that comes uh, to uh, bear on all these 
issues. I should add one other thing. We're, we're really disappointed to hear that people found some of the feedback there uh, depressing or even discouraging, as, as the student asks. But um, you know, what, what we really want to do is we want to give feedback and, and structure that in such a way to give constructive feedback. And I think with self-assessments, it'll allow us to do that in a way that motivates students to continue through the course, too. All right. So, uh, Jordy Pratt's Oops. Rodriguez, we answered a question, uh, you know, from last week from this person, but now here's a question about from this week. So, are spoilers a convention, or are they just a narrative device? And just noticing that, uh, you know, this was also a Cenerentola mm -hmm. where this occurred, uh, but also mentioning that it happens in um, La Traviata Fanchula del West, and I, I, I'd like to expand it beyond just opera. I think this is uh, just a basic dramatic um, function that we often see in dramas. So we were talking about this beforehand. Uh, one of the things that came to my mind within the operatic world was Rigoletto. Some of you saw Rigoletto. Um, and um, you know, early on, Rigoletto is concerned about uh, Monterone, who issues this curse. He's like the maledizione. The act one ends with him talking about you know, what does it mean that I've been cursed, this maledizione? Well, we get to the very end of the opera, and that, those are the last words of the opera, mm -hmm. la maledizione, as he realizes the curse has fallen on him. So uh, Verdi and his um, librettists at the very beginning here start to tip the hand that there is this curse, and now we're going to have to wait and see how it's fulfilled. Uh, I was also thinking about, you know, to step into another world that I know a lot about, and that's the world of Stephen Sondheim. Um, you, if you know Sweeney Todd, there's this character that comes very soon in the, in the musical, a beggar woman who says to Sweeney, hey, don't I know you, mister? And, um, and he shoes her away. She'll come back periodically at different moments. I won't spoil the surprise for those of you who don't know the show, but uh, right there at the very beginning, we're tipped off at there's something maybe we should be watching for when it comes to this woman. Um, and then in the memory, and Adam and I were talking about The Wizard of Oz, again, back to the yeah. film, where I think when we think of The Wizard of Oz, we always think of the, the whole uh, dream sequence, the color part. But mm -hmm. if you look at what happens before the tornado arrives, you know everything about the rest of the movie. It, <laughs> it tells you, it lays it all out for you. So are these spoilers? Is it foreshadowing? Whatever it is, it's part and parcel of dramatic works. And mm. uh, so no surprise that we find these in opera. So um, here's another live question. Uh, Jennifer, you asked it uh, to us. So let's see if we can address this one. Are there any 20th century or 21st century operatic conventions? That is, anything that was introduced after the end of the 19th century? So very great question. Um, and you know, one of the things, that, when I think about music in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, in many respects, we lose the grand narrative, what I would call the grand narrative, where oh, Verdi builds on Bel Canto and Puccini builds on Verdi. In the 20th century, people start going all their own different ways. And mm -hmm. so it's difficult to say there is one thread that can run through all these different works because different people are drawing on different traditions uh, within like a geographic area. So you've got Stravinsky in Paris, you've got Ravel in Paris, you've got Prokofiev in Paris, all doing somewhat similar but slightly different things. And how would you, how would you compare them? So um, I think it, at this point, you are looking at composers and what are the kinds of things that composers do uh, within and across various works rather than say, okay, here's, here's a convention that Verdi and Payer and Mercadante will all use more or less at the same time. So um, no, there really aren't in the same way that we have like uh, Cavatina, or sorry, Cantabile, uh, Cabaletta, mm -hmm. or uh, the way that uh, preludes or overtures behave. We don't have that as much in the 20th and 21st century. I think there are some moments, so, you know, we'd mentioned this opera before uh, last week, The Ghost of Versailles, mm -hmm. that use early conventions in a kind of a winking fashion to say, you know this, I'm using this, uh, <laughs> so you, you can appreciate that this is the Cabaletta or this is the mad scene, mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know, composers don't, by and large, uh, follow conventions the way they did in the 18th and 19th centuries. Interesting. 
So Marie Anita C. There we go. My my West Side Story comes. Out. I know it comes back again. Yeah. Uh huh. She's asking about notes in operas. Yeah. So Steve, do you have a favorite note plot in Italian opera? And maybe if you could give some background about what what we think a note a note plot. So yes. Yeah, so Marie is asking about uh, notes that lead to confusing and tragic moments in operas. And so when you talk about music, you know the first thing I would think about when if anybody writes the word note is like, okay, what's on the page? You know, mm -hmm. these notes that the composer writes down. But I think uh, what Marie Anita C is meaning are kind of like letter or, you know, something mm -hmm. that's written. So it appears and it changes the direction of what's going on. So memory, Adam and I were talking about letters in various Italian operas. So uh, I remembered right off the bat with act one of, um, uh, Le Noce di Figaro, of Cherubino's marching orders. And mm -hmm. and um, so he gets those in Act 2. It, it it creates a lot of tension as trying to figure out what is that thing that the Count has, and that Figaro figures out that it needs a seal. So there's mm -hmm. both of those things that happened there. Um, it was, um, I can't remember who remembered. I think it might have been you, Adam. Remembered was. about Rosina dropping the note off the balcony to Almaviva in Il Barbieri di Sevilla, mm -hmm. and how that then becomes a, a, an interesting turning point as he then in, uh, finds his way in. I was thinking about the apology and invitation that comes to Falstaff in Act Three that uh, gets that whole act in motion about he needs to meet this person at a certain time. Also reminds me of, of the note that um, uh, the Count gets in Act 4 of Le Noce di Figaro. So there's those two. Um, the letter uh, Alfredo's father sends to Violetta in La Traviata. And she you know, she reads it with this melodramatic music underneath. And then she cries out, it's too late. It's, that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, was thinking about Cavaradosi, and we talked about a Luceva and Lestele, and he's writing that note. So, um, but you know, so a favorite. It's like <laughs> I list all those. You know, I, so I love, love, love the the reading and rewriting of the will in Gianni Schicchi. So that's not a letter per se, but that that whole dramatic sequence of. Uh, what needs to go into this piece of writing is mm. really quite funny. And uh, since we've dealt with mostly tragedies or mm -hmm. comedies that are, are not really funny, I really suggest you go look at Johnny Skeeky. It's all of one hour long, and mm. uh, you will be cracking up. Um, now, if I could go outside of Italian opera, I think of uh, Tchaikovsky's Yevgeny Onegin, Eugene Onegin, uh, and the famous letter scene where Tatiana pours out all of her thoughts in a letter. It takes her 14 minutes to write this letter mm. uh, and sing this letter. It's really quite astonishing. And then I was also thinking about another note or piece of paper that gets stolen and um, that is reappears in a, an interesting place. And that's when uh, Sixtus Bess Beckmester uh, takes a song that he sees that Hans Sachs has written down and he's like, okay, I'm going to sing this song and I'm going to win this person's hand. And she tries to do it and he can't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, Hans Sox came up with this. And it's like, no, I didn't. Walter came up with it. And so Walter sings the prize song. This is in Wagner's Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg. So that's another letter um, that comes to mind. So uh, do I have a favorite? I, I just like them all. I really <laughs> like them all. Okay. Adam, here's a question for you. Uh, somebody is curious about our course. Will you tell us how many students originally enrolled, disenrolled, and received certificates? This person sounds like they, they know the behind the scenes stories of yeah. what happens in an edX course. Exactly. So um, we're going to try and do this uh, by using numbers that we've pulled from, from Insights, in, which is one of the tools that edX makes available. Um, we should start by saying this, this first visual is an overview of enrollment. Um, but just really quickly, we've had up to this morning when I when I pulled the the grade report, we've we have seventy three people who are receiving certificates as of um, as of their their grade standing this morning. So to dig a little bit deeper into the actual enrollment numbers, so the total enrollment here, um, and this shows this over time, um, the area in blue is the number of honor track. Uh, or audit track students. The area in pink are the verified certificate track students. Um, and you can just barely see the pink on the top. 
the total enrollment for the course, which includes all enrollments and unenrollments in the in the course itself, is 7,254. That's as of the end of the day yesterday. Our current enrollment, which uh, which takes out the unenrollments, is 6,275. So we've had about 1,000 people unenroll. Um, and there's been a change of 44 in the last week. Uh, we have 33 students who are on the verified track, meaning that they've signed up for the verified certificate, although not all those people are actually on track to get a certificate. Hopefully, they're doing their work at the last minute today, right? Yep. Um, so really quickly, just some other information I think that's interesting as a part of this. Um, we've been really interested in the demographics of our learners as well. So our median student age is about 34 years old. 26.3% uh, of our students are 25 or under, which so I think is a quarter of the class. A quarter of the class. And, and you know, opera gets this bad rap for, for being something that only older people connect with. And I think our course says no to that. 34.6% um, are between 26 and 40 years of age. And 39.1% are 41 and over. Something we're often curious about on the education side of things are, what are the, the various um, education experiences of the students entering into our course. Um, it's worth noting that all of this information is based on your initial edX uh, profile. So this is based on whatever you said when you initially set up your edX profile. Um, we have 19.6% have a high school diploma or less, 35.6% have a college degree, and 42.5% have an advanced degree. So that would be either a master's, doctorate, or, or other level. So it, it's kind of interesting uh, to dig into some of this information. Um, I hope I hope that gets at some of what what Stephanie or C. Stephanie was was looking for. We'll probably need to dig a little bit farther yeah. to see exactly of the people who are on track to get certificates or the people mm -hmm. who have been very active in the course and where do they fit into all these? You know, do we do the younger people fall off? Do do the, are they also completing all this work? Yeah, we're, we're hoping to create a one-pager that kind of tells the story of the course and some of the students' experiences. So perhaps that's something we can share out on social media, at least, once the course is, is finished. But uh, we have a lot of work in Excel ahead of us, I okay, think. Okay, good enough. So here was a question uh, from Sadie T, uh, who asked for a reading list. And, you know, and um, wow, I, that, that could go on forever. But here, you know, what, what is Sadie asking for us? So could you recommend a general reference book that would cover major operas and would offer facts and suggestions about what to listen for? So, I mean, there are a number of books out there, and um, I can tell you right off the bat, I haven't written any of them. Uh, so I don't get any kickback about what I'm going to recommend. But when I first came to Dartmouth and was looking around uh, for a book to teach opera, you know, I'm trying to figure out how do I balance scholarly rigor with drawing people into understanding what is um, at its base a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And one of the books that uh, was new when I came to Dartmouth was called is called The Story of Opera by... Uh, Somerset Ward. There's a slide of it there. And uh, it goes in and out of print. Uh, you can typically get it used. And I, I find the book just so wonderfully compelling because as you can see uh, right here in this slide, that's a, a shot from, um, it looks like uh, the, uh, the magic flute. Um, there, there are so many incredible photos in there. So it's a coffee table book, something that uh, people would uh, be happy to put uh, in their living rooms and have people thumb through. And then you could show people, oh, yes, yes, I took this opera MOOC, and let me tell you about Aida, or let me tell you about The Marriage of Figaro. And then, then you get a chance to brag. Um, <laughs> but it also has wonderful stories about the com composition of the operas, people who've sung in them, um, uh, certain moments in the operas that stand out. So that would be the book that I'd go to. I have other scholarly books I could refer people to. Uh, and we've not really said this before, but you can write to Adam or to me or memory yeah, here at Dartmouth, and we're, we're happy to answer uh, your other kinds of questions that you might have. So feel free to, um, to do that as well. But that would be the one book I'd say you ought to get uh, going. And th then I'm going to go to Amazon, and if it's sold out, I'm really going to be upset with everybody. <laughs> but anyway. So uh, Joanna five, uh, sorry, jo Joanne three five two has asked the question 
about, you know, she can't, hasn't been able to finish. Will I be able to access the course later so that I can finish? Yeah, so thank you for, for this question. Um, I guess one of the things to, to start off with is it depends on what you mean by finishing. Um, so if you're, if you're planning to explore additional course materials, uh, the answer is yes. If you're looking to earn a certificate beyond the, the dates we set up during the announcements part of this Hangout, um, there isn't a way to do that, but we might set up for a reoffer. There might be other ways to do that. Um, so the long and the short of it, um, for all current students, you will maintain access to the archived version of the course, and we have no plan to put an end date on that as of now. Um, the only difference between that and the actual course is you can't get grades on assignments that you do that way, but you can still use those assignments as self-study tools. Uh, and the discussions will be turned off, and they'll be in a read-only state. So any existing discussions will be visible. You can still take a look at those, uh, but there won't be any new contributions. And largely, that's because we we don't have the resources really to continue moderating the discussion. Um, so so that that's how the course will continue to be archived. If you're looking uh, to tell your friends or family about this experience you've had, and and you're looking to share this out with other people who are not currently enrolled in the course. This archived course that we'll be setting up will also be open to new enrollments. So you can feel free to tell other people to come in and take a look as well. Um, so yeah, so you can access the course. OK, so it's like a library where you can go back and, and take things out, but there's not going to be a tutor there in the library to make sure that you get graded on things. Exactly. And it's worth it's worth noting that we'll, we'll try and keep the, the Facebook uh, page up and, and some of those things. Um, but you know we'll we'll try and do our best with with addressing questions. People can reach out to us directly too, as yeah. you mentioned. And we're still waiting for takedown notices from all the the people <laughs> whose uh, uh, material we've used. And so you know things may disappear down the road if, if people decide that they wanted to sue us. But uh, we've tried to be very generous, very liberal in what we've made available to you all. And um, so uh, please feel free to keep on watching these, send, sending out the links to other people and getting oh, them involved. Uh, and uh, because that does feed into this next question in certain kinds of ways. This next, and I think it's the last question we have for this particular office hour. So. Yep, so Marie Anita C asked another, another question of us. So what can we do to convince you to offer another opera course? And man, this is this is probably the biggest question we could get at this point in the course. And there was this amazing back and forth that we've tried to capture here with uh, Jennifer and Angela and Kay Klotch and Terry Glenn uh, arguing about what should be the next course. Um, so French is it, is it French? Is it German? French would be fantastique. <laughs> so um, well, as with all things in life, uh, it boils down to a question of time and money, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, one of the things we were talking about, Adam and I, as we are looking at bringing this course to an end, is when will I be teaching the opera course next mm -hmm. here on campus? And I was planning on not teaching it again until spring 2017, mm -hmm. so a year plus change from now. But I've made a change in my own teaching yeah. schedule, so I'll be teaching the course on campus this upcoming spring. And one of the things we want to do is to try and figure out, are there things that we might be able to do uh, within the residential course that then would let us um, maybe capture some of the things uh, on these other language groups. Because uh, some of you might remember from the last office hour, I talked about uh, how on campus I teach the course first opera in Italian. Mm -hmm. We do that for three and a half weeks or so. Then I teach opera in French. Then I teach opera in German, then opera in Slavic languages, and then opera in English. So I do cover a lot more territory than we've been able to cover in this MOOC. So we're going to be looking to see, can, is, are there things that we might capture uh, in either video or other kinds of learning uh, environments that we might be able uh, to MOOCify later on uh, and uh, come back to uh, doing a French or a German opera MOOC. And, but uh, much of it will, depend on time and money to do the animations and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things that takes a lot of time and it chews up a lot of resources so but uh, we want to thank you uh, yeah for asking about this um, because um, it's been very exciting for us to receive email 
uh, both through uh, the, the discussion boards or, you know, comments through the discussion boards or email directly to mm -hmm. us about people learning about Italian opera and getting excited about yeah, totally. what they're learning and uh, being able to share that excitement with other people. Uh, we're thrilled about that and the idea that you'd like more of it uh, yeah. ju it really kind of it makes our day. It really does. So um, we have this slide about um, different kinds of opera uh, posts that along these lines that people have written uh, uh, in terms of listening skills, improving what bel canto means. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, as I'm looking at this, and I'm going to have to look at it a little offline. I really hadn't taken the time to read these things. Mm. I'm thinking I'll get teary if I try and read these uh, before you all. But I do want to thank you all for going on this adventure with us. Uh, again, want to encourage you to look at the the finale lecture because um, if all goes well and we slip past the censors, um, <laughs> uh, you're going to see yourself in some of what we've uh, put together. You know, so many of us started out being somewhat unknowledgeable about opera, but by the hopefully by the end, those of us who stuck with it uh, do see opera in the lives that we live. And that's one of the things we we're trying to capture in that finale um, lecture. So uh, as always, it's our time to thank folks for helping us out in uh, not only this live office hour, but also throughout the class. And so uh, for this live office hour, we want to thank Jones Media Center, uh, Dan Maxwell Crosby, who's been operating the camera, Memory Apata Brady, who has been fielding the live stream, so we know things that were happening there, my God's Word, who is uh, handling the slides that you all have been seeing, uh, and my good friend, Adam <laughs> Nemiroff, who has designed this course and made it work for all of us who've been involved. And of course, Steve, you, thank you for all your time, energy, and intellect in this experience. It's incredible. So tell your friends about opera. Um, hope to see you at the Met. I'm going to be seeing Turandot on January That's 15th. Exciting. That's going to be exciting. Going to see some of the simulcasts up here. Um, not only Italian opera, I'm seeing Lulu, uh, the uh -huh. German opera, on Saturday down at the Met. So, um, so if you're at the Met or coming up here, let us know, and uh, hopefully we'll see you then. And um, uh, enjoy your adventures in Italian opera. See you soon.